Number 10, Pasiphae and the Bull. The gods, man, they love to throw some bestiality as punishment at their will and pleasure. Um, Equus probably would have been their favorite Broadway show. <laughs> Everyone knows the story of the Minotaur, but do you know how it all got started? Well, let me enlighten you. King Minos begged the god Poseidon to send him a glorious white bull that he could sacrifice. The god obliged. He sent him the most beautiful, stunning creature from out of the sea, because the apparently bulls come out of the sea. Anyways, but when King Minos went to sacrifice the creature, he found he could not bring himself to kill such a noble beast, so he just killed another bull instead. Outraged by his disobedience, Poseidon punished him by making his wife Pasiphae fall into uncontrollable lust with the bull. She convinced an Athenian inventor to create a hollow wooden bull for her to hide in, kind of like a Trojan horse, that could facilitate a union. Yeah. Like a, a union. You get what I mean by that? Yeah. She then later gave birth to the one, the only, the Minotaur, which would later plague King Minos and all that fun stuff. You know, like the whole labyrinth thing. Yeah. That story. Weird. Don't understand it. But here it is. Number nine, Arachne. You'd think if someone was really good at something, they should be rewarded. But no, oh no, that's not how the ancient gods worked. Their egos were very fragile. Sorry. Okay, chill out. Anyways, Arachne was a girl who was an incredibly talented seamstress, which made her a little bit cocky. One day she was so proud of her work that she proclaimed that she was a better weaver than Athena. Athena was the goddess of wisdom and war, so not a good person to mess with. Athena warned her not to make such claims, but she ignored her, so the two faced off. The two had a weaving contest in which Arachne ended up winning in front of all of the onlookers, but Athena didn't accept defeat gracefully and instead of rewarding her, punished Arachne to feel immense overwhelming guilt, causing her to take her own life. But that wasn't enough for Athena. The goddess brought her back as a giant spider who would forever weave her designs in the forms of webs. Not very nice. Not very nice indeed. Number eight, Airy Sikthen. Are rich people rich because they're greedy or greedy because they're rich? Either way, Erisichthon was, bottom line, a very greedy man with wealth that spilled over. Kind of like the Sun King, really. Planning to build another feast hall for himself because he needed another one, he demanded that a massive grove of trees be cut down to make room. This grove, however, was sacred to Demeter, the goddess of Earth. But the men did as he asked, save for one tree. One tree was left standing, covered in beautiful wreaths, symbolizing every prayer she'd ever granted. When the men wouldn't do it, Erisichthon tried to do it himself. While doing so, he killed the dryad who lived in the tree, which really didn't bode well with the goddess. To suit his greed, she set down Lemos, the divine representation of starvation. Overwhelmed by a formidable hunger, the more he ate, the more he desired. He sold off his entire fortune, including his own daughter, to buy more and more food, but nothing would slake his hunger. Finally, he began eating himself, bit by bit, until he finally perished in his own greed, destitute and alone. So moral of the story is don't cut down trees, or don't be greedy and don't cut down trees. Number 7, Jason and the Argonauts. Avenger level threat acquired. For some reason in our lives, you find stories of our favorite heroes forming almighty and powerful groups. The Avengers, the Justice League, BTS. That one, that one might have too much power. But yes, Jason and the Argonauts were a band of heroes on adventures, slaying beasts, taking names, and Greekifying the area. Sadly, for Jason and the Argonauts, every time they try and make a movie about it, it just, uh, it just never works for them, I don't know. They had a visually impressive one in the 60s and everything after that has just been a complete misfire. Hollywood, if your casting calls come my way, just, just know I make a great Jason. Look at me, I, I could be Jason. A sword, a shield, and there we go, that's it. Number six, Kronos. I like how the Greek gods are as like chaotic to how the world is in Greek mythology. It kind of makes a weird sort of sense, you know? This weird godly family was messed up from the very beginning, and if you don't know the original story of Cronus, then, well, here you go. Before the gods of Olympus, before Zeus and Hera, there were the elder gods Gaia and Uranus, and then their son Cronus, who married Rhea. Kronos overthrew his father, and when he heard that one of his children was going to do the same thing, he decided to eat them. All of them. Just 
gobbled them down like an aspirin. Rhea wasn't a huge fan of the whole thing, and eventually enough was enough. So when Cronus went to swallow Zeus, Rhea tricked him and gave him a rock instead. She stole Zeus and hid him away until the day he would be strong enough to return and overtake his father. Disguised as a cupbearer, he gave his father a purgative, which made him puke up all of his siblings. Together, they stormed against their father and overthrew him after 10 years in battle. Whew, that's a rough, that's a rough start to family life. Of, and then Zeus married his sister, and there was a whole bunch of ins and it's just, you know what I mean, you, you've heard that. At number five, democracy? Though the Greeks are often credited with the creation of democracy, much like anything else in this world, it has a dark history. One of injustice and bloodshed. Back in the days of ancient Greece and in the relatively early days of democracy, this political practice could sometimes be used for nefarious purposes. One of the best examples of that comes from the Mytilian debate of 427 BC. Basically what happened here is that during the Peloponnesian War, the city state of Mytilene tried to free itself from the influence of Athens. Their revolt ultimately failed and the citizens of the city state were subjected to a severe punishment. They decided to not only execute the prisoners that they'd taken to Athens, but also the entire adult male population and women and children were sold into slavery. The vote to put a stop to Mytilene weighed heavily on the minds of those who voted for this outcome, so they later staged another vote, ultimately choosing to only punish those who were directly involved in the city's revolt. Number four, Ixion. This one is confusing because it prompts a question I've never wanted to ask. How do you even make love to a cloud? When Ixion, the king of Lapiths and the son of Ares, married Dia, the daughter of Dionysus, he promised him a gift. However, when Ixion reneged on the promise, Dionysus stole some of his horses. Enraged, Ixion invited him to dinner to make amends, but instead pushed him into a fiery pit of coals. I mean, he is the son of Ares, like what you expect. He was banished for such a crime because it was completely uncool, but after a few years, wandering sad and alone, Zeus took pity on him and invited him up to Olympus. That's a good idea, where Ixion got the hots for Hera. Zeus decided to see if he would actually even try it, like would he even try it? And so he sent him a cloud shaped like Hera. Ixion did try it, and he made love with the cloud, and even stranger, it got pregnant. <laughs> Their union gave birth to the first centaurs who were literally and figuratively horny little half horse, half human people that roamed the world. <laughs> As further punishment, Ixion was thrown from Olympus, struck by Zeus's lightning bolt, and bound by Hermes to a fiery spinning wheel. Some people just really don't deserve your pity, man. They just don't. Number three, Narcissus. This one's in the name. Basically, there was a guy named Narcissus, and he was gorgeous. Like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Ryan Reynolds gorgeous. I'll just all put together. Oh. And he knew it, and he loved his image. Now, as a guy who goes on camera every day, naturally, you hate yourself. You hate your self-image. That's how it goes. Ask anyone here, they would tell you the same thing. But also, as someone who's on camera every day and funny from time to time, you kind of like yourself on camera, and you kind of like your self-image. It's a very strange relationship we have. However, no one is as bad as it comes to as narcissists. One day in the forest, he came across a body of water where he saw his reflection cast. And it was so handsome, so gorgeous, that he couldn't look away, ever. Hence the name Narcissist, or Narcissist. Or what most girls in high school find out what their boyfriends have. Narcissism. Ladies, let me know. Have you ever dated someone who has narcissism or looked in the mirror too long? Let me know. I'm curious. Number two, Pan. What a weirdo. Pan is literally the weirdest horn dog god who ever graced the planet Earth. Firstly, the way this dude came to be makes no sense. There are many versions, but one of them involves Odysseus's lonely wife getting jiggy with 108 suitors. Pan, like. Stamina, right? Pan had the hind legs and horn of a goat and was the god of shepherds, flocks, hunters, forests, pastoral music, and fertility. The last one being the most prominent. Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye would have been this guy's anthem. He pursued everything and everyone, nymphs being his favorite. They would be so desperate to get away from him, they'd have to turn into trees, Mira, reeds. Echo was even killed by his minions when she denied him. He could also multiply himself, creating like a swarm of pan. He also, he's also the only god who ever died, but no one is quite sure how that happened. So again, another confusing thing about him. Number one, last but not least, Theestes and Atreus. 
This next one will have your brain scrambled by the end. Fiestes and Atreus were brothers constantly at odds. While their father, the king of Mike and I, was away at war, they seized the city and Atreus became king. He sacrificed a lamb with a golden fleece to seal the deal with Artemis and gave the fleece to his wife, who was fooling around with his brother Thyestes and she gave the fleece to him. Thyestes made his brother swear that whoever had the fleece would be king, and thinking that his wife kept it safe, he agreed. Thyestes then showed the fleece. Astrius, pissed off, asked the gods for help. Hermes told him to tell Thyestes to promise that he would be made king again if the sun went backwards in the sky. Thyestes agreed, thinking it was impossible, so Zeus made it happen. Then Atreus fed Thyestes his own sons for dinner unknowingly and banished him as punishment. I know. Then an oracle told Thyestes that in order to exact revenge, his own daughter had to have his son. Like, so he made that happen in the grossest way possible. And then, it sounds like I'm talking about like some dramatic like housewife show. And then the son grew up, killed Atreus, and Thyestes became king. But wait, Atreus' sons, Agamemnon and Menelau, came back, overthrew him, and Agamemnon finally became king, ending the whole cycle. <sighs> We're good. All right, I'm tired after that one. At number 10, spicy defense. Usually when you think about wars from ancient times, you think of swords, spears, bows, and arrows as being the primary weapons used to fight, but that wasn't entirely the case with the ancient Greeks. It turns out that their warfare was a lot more advanced than you'd think. The ancient Greeks were actually known to have used chemical warfare as part of their defense. They were known to use poison-tipped arrows and incendiary weapons. The earliest example of such a thing in ancient Greece comes from the siege of Plataea in 429 BC, when Spartan soldiers set fire to a wood pile with sulfur, releasing sulfur dioxide gas into the air and forcing the opposing force to flee their positions. According to other accounts, they may have also poisoned the water supply. The most famous case of chemical warfare from the Greeks, however, comes from the Byzantine Greeks when they invented a petroleum-based substance that couldn't be extinguished with water and would be fired from tubes that were attached to Greek ships. What's so cool about that is the fact that no one has ever been able to recreate it. At number 9, hashtag roasted. I'm sure you've no doubt heard of the messed up punishment devices that have been used throughout history. I have to say that the people of the past were very creative when it came to coming up with ways to bring harm to others, and the ancient Greeks were no exception. I mean, they certainly weren't the worst when it came to their punishments, but they still were going a little overboard. One of their famously horrific torture devices was called the brazen bull. It was a large hollow casting of a bull made from bronze that had a door installed into the side of it. When someone was up for punishment via the brazen bull, they would be stuffed inside the statue, the door would be closed on them, and a fire would be lit under the bull, heating the metal statue. The person inside would then be sadly roasted alive. I would much rather be roasted on Twitter than inside this mighty metal bull, that's for sure. Before we carry on talking about the messed up things that went on in ancient Greece, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number eight, questionable relationships. The ancient Greeks had some pretty questionable habits when it came to the coming of age of young Greeks. The idea of a relationship between an older person and one who has not yet come of age was not only normal, but was encouraged. As part of the coming of age of young Greek boys, they would be part of a ritualistic kidnapping. Now don't worry, they weren't actually being taken from their beds in the middle of the night. This was more so an agreement made by the boy's father ahead of time, but either way, they would still be taken by an older person from the community, where they would be taken out into the wilderness and taught how to hunt, they would feast, and they would learn how to be an adult. They would later return to the community where they would be given the choice of either severing ties with their adult partner or continuing their relationship with them. It's certainly a little unsettling the fact that this kind of thing was normal. Number seven, Leda and the Swan. Like, Zeus, head of the gods, the one we all should be looking up to was like questionably immoral. But like, I mean, when you're a god, you can kind of do what you want. This story hurts my head because I just, like how does A get to B? Anyways, Leda was the daughter of the king of Pleuron in Atolia and wife to Tyndarus. One day she wandered by the river Eurotas and Zeus fell hard for this bathing beauty, but he just couldn't show up in his true form because one, Hera, his wife and sister, was watching and two, 
she probably would explode if she saw his true form. So he went to Aphrodite to ask what to do and she transformed him into an immaculate swan. By either seduction or nefarious action, there's two sides to the story. Some say he her and others say that she was into it. I don't know. Lita became pregnant either way and gave birth to two eggs. Eggs? Inside the eggs were two sets of twins. One, the infamous Helen of Troy and Polydeficus, and the other two were born from Leda's husband, Clytemnestra and Castor. One pair was immortal and the other mortal, which is also still confusing because like, didn't Helen of Troy die? I don't know. There was also another version which is pretty much the same tale except it was the goddess Nemesis, not Leda, and, and Zeus turned into a beaver and it was just really weird, so again, Confusing. No idea what's going on. At number six, deformed males. Further on the topic of the presence of women in ancient Greek society, let's talk about how women were seen in their communities. Now, even though Aristotle was considered to be one of the greatest philosophers in history, his ideas were also quite flawed. During his life, he believed that women were deformed males who were created when, quote, something went wrong in their mother's wombs. Unquote. They considered women to be so terrible that the philosopher Plato also warned men against being reincarnated as a woman in the next life, saying that this could be avoided if they had lots of success during their current lifetime. Because of this view on women, baby girls were often abandoned, girls' education focused primarily on how to have and raise a family, and when girls were married off, they were considered to be property like I mentioned in the previous number. Number 5, Sisyphus. Oh baby do I feel this one. Story of my life, honestly, day late and a dollar short. Some of you folks at home may also share the same fate as me and this chiseled Greek man doomed for eternity. This one is also one of my favorites. Basically, Sisyphus was cheating the devil. Cheating death itself, actually. After sliming his way out of the underworld one too many times, Big Daddy Zeus had to intervene. Also, when I say I relate to him, it's not because I'm a trickster who cheats my demise or cheats the, the devil or, or Hades. I'll explain. So, after Sisyphus had done what he'd done, Zeus sentenced him to roll a giant boulder up a hill for eternity. When he gets to the top, she rolls back down to the bottom and he has to start all over again, every day for the rest of time. Not just life, for time. Sometimes in life it feels like you're on a grind and you work and work and work and sometimes you go right back to square one no matter how hard you work. That sucks and that can be exhausting, but never give up because Chetty ain't and neither should you. At number four, crime and punishment. Earlier I mentioned one of the gruesome ways that people were punished in ancient Greece, but let me tell you some more about their ways of crime and punishment. The standard form of executing prisoners was by performing what was called a bloodless crucifixion. Basically, the convicted individual would quote, be fastened to a board by the wrists and ankles and a collar around the neck would be tightened gradually to strangle them to death. End quote. If an execution had to take place on a battlefield, the accused would be beheaded, but if given the option, you could sometimes avoid a violent death by instead choosing to ingest poison on your own terms. If you committed a crime and were able to avoid execution, then you would be exiled. If your crime was bad enough to be banished from your community, then your name and crime would be inscribed somewhere so that no one forgot what you did, meaning that your crime would be known for the rest of time. Number three, Alcyon and Ceyx. This one kind of hurts my heart. I mean, it's Honest. The love story between these two is just something everyone longs for. They were admired by humans and the gods, and yet they were still punished for it. What? Alcyon was the daughter of the god of wind and devoted wife to King Ceyx of Trachis. They were so in love with each other, they often playfully called each other Zeus and Hera. Despite many of the gods admiring them, and this was clearly an endearment, Zeus wasn't pleased. How dare they compare themselves to the gods? So he waited until Ceyx planned to visit the oracle against his wife's wishes, who was concerned the wind he faced would be too harsh on the sea. Even her father had difficulty controlling it. But he did, and Zeus stirred a storm that sunk the ship. With his last breath, Ceyx prayed his body would be brought back to his wife. Hera took pity on the mournful widow and sent a messenger and the body back to her. After burying her husband, she flung herself into the sea to be reunited with him. The gods were horrified by Zeus's actions because they loved the two of them, so he tried to atone for his rash action by transforming them into kingfisher birds. Yeah, Zeus, turning them into birds, it really fixes everything, don't? You're fine. At number two, ostracism. 
In Athens, back during ancient Greece, ostracism was a common aspect of political life. Back then, the citizens would evaluate the performance of their politicians. They would then vote on who didn't serve them well or who they didn't like, and the citizens would write the name of said person on a piece of broken pottery. The person who gained the most votes from the public would then be exiled from Athens for 10 years. Unfortunately, this was kind of a flawed system, and any clever politician would then be able to use this ostracism vote in order to get rid of their rival. After Athenians figured out the flaw in their system, their ostracism votes were later ended. And finally, at number one, sacrifice. At this point, after learning about so many ancient civilizations, I think it's safe to assume that basically every civilization had their sacrifices. Human sacrifices, I mean. It's been theorized that perhaps the ancient Greeks were participating in such practices because back in 2016, the remains of a teenager were found on Mount Lycaon, which appeared to have been, quote, a product of ritual sacrifice, end quote. It is thought that perhaps this person was meant to serve as a sacrifice to the god Zeus. On top of that, there has also been pieces of ancient literature that depicts the sacrificing individuals in the same area that those remains were found. We don't know for certain if this kind of ritual was part of everyday life or if it was just a one-off type deal. Number 10, Clash of the Titans. An Avengers level threat, baby. The Titans were the big bad giants who ruled over the earth and the gods. Naturally, they all got along and there were never any problems, ever. <laughs> Yeah, right. They fought like cats and dogs, though I never understood that because all the dogs and cats I know always got along great. But the Titans fought, and, and they fought some more. Until your favorite boy Zeus had enough and kind of took control over everything. It's Zeus, it's what he does. It's too bad Aaron Yeager wasn't there to help out. Number 9, Prometheus. Poor Prometheus. This is my favorite tale from Greek mythology. I think it's rather sad for Prometheus. All he wanted to do was give us the knowledge of fire, and, and look at all the things that we did with it. Forged iron and steel, heated our homes, so no one would ever go cold again. And we cooked, which gave Gordon Ramsay 23 hit shows and a reason to curse when asking for the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? Prometheus went directly against Zeus's orders, and if you didn't know, that's kind of a bad thing. It can wind you up in a rather unfortunate position. A position like being chained up and having a large bird come feast on your intestines. Like I eat mom's spaghetti. She makes a good spaghetti, thanks mom. You make a good spaghetti. Number eight, Icarus. I think we can all relate to this one, or at least have been told a version of this when we were flush. Things were going good for us. In a nutshell, Icarus got some wax wings and gained the ability to flight. Mind you, that was probably the dream of many ancient peoples. After Icarus got his wings, he got a little arrogant. He wanted to push his wings to the limit. Kind of like Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. But instead of falling in a multi-million dollar super suit and looking handsome while doing it, Icarus sniffed one too many of his own farts and flew too close to the sun where he burned up in it. So what's the lesson learned here, folks? Keep yourself grounded and don't sniff your own farts. <laughs> <laughs> At number seven, backwards logic. It was tough being a woman in ancient Greece. I mean, it's been tough being a woman at any time throughout history, and we're still fighting for our place in society on many fronts, but back in the times of ancient Greece, they had it really bad. Part of Greek society included the notion that women were objects, and as a result, the Greeks saw adultery as a worse crime than non-consensual relations. Now you're probably scratching your head thinking, why? And my dear viewer, I will tell you why they had this sort of backwards logic. You see, since women were considered to be objects and property, any kind of misconduct or mistreatment to a woman, especially one spouse, this was considered to be almost like theft of this object, and so if found guilty, the person responsible for this injustice would be tried for adultery, not the real crime at hand, being the mistreatment of a woman. The punishment for an adulterer was quite severe, as when caught, they could risk being killed on the spot, and in the event of whatever affair, that would be grounds for an immediate divorce. Number six, her Hercules, 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 the strong one, or the one where Danny DeVito coaches him through the process of being a Greek legend. If Danny DeVito is coaching you through anything, that probably means you're gonna come out on top. And yes, before you start typing in the comment section, technically speaking, Hercules is the Roman copy of Heracles. I know. However, it's kind of one of those things that everyone just knows the one, so anytime a Greek dude shows up with muscles, you blush and you think of Hercules. As far as Greek mythology goes, it doesn't get any more classic than a super strong guy with abs and biceps, and maybe a little bit of olive oil on, I don't know. Number five, the story of Mira. What is she pointing at? Ever been so sad and disheartened that you just, you just wish you could turn into a tree? Yeah, me too. 
than people who just leave me alone. However, the only person to ever successfully transform into a tree was Mira, who turned into the Mer Tree. But the story behind it is kind of uh, messed up. Mira loved her father. A little too much. Like way too much. She was in love with her father and desperately wanted to be with him. She knew it was wrong and tried everything to resist the gnawing desire inside of her, even trying to take her own life. Her nurse found her and fearing ever parting with her, decided to work up a scheme to hitch the two together. On the celebration of Bacchus, the queen hitched town, so the bed was empty. You see where this is going. Disguised as a maid, the nurse brought Mira to his bedchamber for 12 straight nights. On the final night, the king, overwhelmed with curiosity, removed the mask she was wearing. When he discovered that his lover had been his daughter, he reached for his sword and tried to kill her. Makes sense. Mira fled her father and ran across the desert for nine months and surprise, she was pregnant. Ugh. When she couldn't run anymore, she begged the gods to hide her from the world. They took pity on her and turned her into the Mer Tree, which one day would be hit by a running boar, revealing the child Adonis tucked into the bark. Adonis was also supposed to be super hot and awesome, which totally doesn't play by the rules of like incest. Like usually something goes wrong there. Remember Joffrey? Like that. Didn't go well. Number four, King Midas. The lesson in this one, folks, is to be careful what you wish for. King Midas was being granted a wish. He wished for anything I touch be turned to gold. Now, I'm not an economist because I already have too many jobs on the internet, but you can imagine how at today's rate of gold, how wealthy you would be. Sheesh! Yeah, gold was valuable back then, but now, wowie wee wah. So his wish was granted, and everything he touched turned to gold, which for a good couple hours must have been the most fun anyone has ever had ever. Dude was seeing drachma signs. However, this wealthy gift he had been given quickly turned into a curse or a burden. Everything he touched turned to gold. That included his food. Because of this, he starved. To fix this burden, he bathed in a river, and it said that's why gold can be found in that river. I wouldn't mind having that power myself, but if I made food gold, or even worse, what if I made my beer gold? Lahar, Lahar. At number three, this is Sparta. As you could imagine, childhood during ancient times was certainly no easy cakewalk, but one of the worst upbringings in ancient Greece had to go to the young citizens of Sparta. Just to give you an idea of how life might have been as a Spartan, just think about the fact that it was literally written into law that Spartans had to be quote, fearless, ruthless, and disciplined above all else. End quote. Back then, a young Spartan boy would only grow up with his parents until he was seven years old, which at this point he would then be sent to a military camp run by the state where he would stay until he turned 30. Young Spartans were taught mostly about fighting, perfecting the art of combat, and would spend very little time learning math and music. These kids were taught to be ruthless, stealing for their survival, and not showing any fear towards their enemies. Number two, Medusa. I feel like a lot of people know this one. Medusa, the half beautiful lady, half head of snakes in her head, and, and half monster thing with powers. Yes, I realize that was three halves and that doesn't add up, but you're talking to a guy who was voted class clown in the high school yearbook and not voted most likely to succeed in math. Cause I just wouldn't. But she was the Gorgon monster who would turn men into stone. I, I, I do know that. If they looked into her eyes. That was until your boy Perseus showed up like Link with a mirror shield and gave her a taste of her own medicine. What's the lesson on this one? I'm not sure. Maybe it's don't be so sure of your abilities. Maybe it's seeing things through. Or maybe it's having an extensive knowledge of tactics from a late 90s Nintendo character. That you, you never know when you're gonna need that. You never know. I, I, I know that stuff. That can come in handy. Number one, Pandora's box. I know you guys know this one, but this one is so simple. At first glance, it's not about turning things into gold or weird snakehead ladies or giants rising from beneath the earth to fight each other. It's a box. Something ain't good in that box, but it's just a box. So don't open it. I'm gonna say it again because there's gonna be people in the comment section that are gonna say, but Chetty, because you said don't open it, that means I really wanna open it. Imagine I'm Robert De Niro telling you not to open it. Nope, no way, nope, not gonna happen. Nope, null and void, don't do it, don't do it. That's how you know I'm serious, because I did a bad impression. Oh great, somebody open it. Yes, that's right, Pandora's box was opened and it said that all the evils of the world were released from the box. Good tale, good moral, but who the heck thought putting all those evil things in the world in the box was a great idea? Whatever happened to just having memento boxes? You know, you open up a thing like this is the time I farted on camera, this is the time I went to the cottage, you know what I mean? Whatever happened to that? 